Okay. Here's a quote I like. There is still an immense amount of, to be learned about health. But if what is at present known to a few were part of the general knowledge, the average expectation of life would probably be increased by about 10 years. So really focus about knowledge. It's about knowledge. It's about doing, about action. And this goes right along with the WHO's declaration. The obstacles to health are not some big thing or super bug out there. It's your ignorance and complacency. And that's why we do what we do. And speaking about our topic tonight and our, our guest tonight, and I, I'm so grateful that he was able to take, out of, take time out of his busy schedule to do this. But we, we want to talk about bone density, and not just bone density, but body, body mass composition. And he's going to explain what exactly that means. But in keeping with our philosophy, you have to realize that there are a combination of factors that, that, that influence bone density. And he's going to be talking about quite a few of them tonight. So uh, be sure to get a piece of paper and a pen and, and be ready to take notes because this is really, really going to be a very, very informative webinar. And I just want to, again, thank Dr. Cates for being on. And Sherry, would you like to go ahead and introduce him? I would be glad to. Okay, Dr. Case is the CEO of Integrative Health Technologies Incorporated and working with co-investigators from major universities over the past 35 years, Dr. Case has conducted numerous independent studies evaluating the safety and efficacy of nutritional supplements, including an ongoing 15-year uh, longitudinal trial on the effects of glyconutrients on immune health. Measurement of over 2 million sophisticated medical biomarkers taken during these studies have been compiled into one of the nation's largest medical databases. The database includes 25,000 um, DEXA, I'm sure he'll explain to us what that means, derived measures of body composition, bone, lean, and fat, and almost a half million blood chemistry measurements. Wow. Dr. Kate is a member, fellow, or diplomat of a variety of nutritional and research-based professional organizations. He received his Ph.D. in psychology from the University of Colorado in 1969 while serving as an associate professor of psychology at the Air Force Academy. He retired from the Air Force in 1974 after accumulating over 7,000 hours as a navigator that included a combat tour during the Vietnam conflict and assignment as a navigator for Air Force Two. Wow, sounds like you have had an interesting life, Dr. Cates. Are you there? I'm here. Okay, right. we're not seeing your slides yet. Okay, so I, should I put this, show my screen business over okay. here and I'll pop Great. them up. Perfect. Are we there now? Uh, takes just a moment, there we go. Okay. That was funny, you know, Sherry, when uh, you're reading that introduction, I, I made a presentation, you know, a few months back and about this research we did, and I'm coming up with this just thinking I'm really going to make a major contribution to this group of people here. You know, when they hear all this research I've done and all this information presented in slides, you know, and I got a big round of applause, and then when I got all finished and people came up to me, no one asked anything about the <laughs> technical information. They just want to know about Air Force Two. <laughs> so I'm saying, hey, come on, guys. I mean, what about my intellect here? I mean, you know, I am a PhD, you know. Let's have some respect. Now, in fact, I started off by telling him, you know, yeah, when uh, when I was growing up, I told my mother I wanted to be a PhD, and when I grow, grow up, she said, you can't do both. <laughs> a little pause there, you find out whether or not people are getting it, you know. You know, when David... When David contacted me here, you know, I looked at his, uh, I looked at the the, uh, the webinar mission over here, you know, that I've got presented on the screen right now. It's sort of a little modification of what he had, but certainly it is something I think that they're right on about the kinds of things we need to do. You can talk all you want about these healthcare visions and so forth that are coming out of Washington, but you know, I think the issue of increase your health literacy over time. You can make so many simple steps. One of the major things that's going on in clinical research today is we used to ask questions like, 
what percent of the people die from a heart attack? What percent die from cancer? Now there's a shift here. There really is a way of reframing that now to where we're saying, wait a minute, why do they die of cancer? Why do they die of heart disease? Let's get beyond that and take a look and you can go back into the research two or three decades ago and see where researchers were telling people it isn't cancer that's killing you most of the time, it isn't heart disease, it's three different things in the way you live your life. You move too little, you eat too much of the wrong kinds of things, and you smoke too many cigarettes. Those three things have been the major causes of death for what is now about three decades. And folks, those are things you can change tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And what you do is then take that statistic and start looking at this from a standpoint of saying, hey, it's not, it's not the cardiac disease and cancer I need to worry about. What I need to do is change the root cause of these things by making these lifestyle changes. And clearly one pathway to that is knowledge. You simply have to know something in order to make it change. One of the things that I've learned after doing this for 30 some years is a very simple behavioral principle. And that ties directly into research as well as to in increasing health literacy. And that's a basic understanding of behavior modification is what gets measured gets managed. What gets measured and tracked gets managed better. Mm -hmm. What mm -hmm. gets measured, tracked, and graphed gets managed best of all. Mm. So that's the benefit that both testing and information have for each individual. And one of the things we learned, and I, I realize I'm going to be trying to talk into some, you, some of you people into taking some of these important tests, that will validate your own experience when you start finding out, yeah, once I get these measurements, it does make a difference in my lifestyle. And so as we're going through with this, I want you to remember that principle. There are several principles I think you'd like to take away from uh, the seed in this discussion. One is the business of what gets measured gets managed. The other one is, the, is, is what we'll talk about is that weight loss essentially has no major effect on our health and well-being. It really is the kind of weight that we lose, not the amount of weight that we lose, that is the pathway to optimal health. That's huge. Now, can you say that again? Yeah. It, what we're saying is what we've learned after doing thousands and thousands of measurements of fat, lean, and bone, what we've learned is that the pathway to optimal health is not how much weight you lose or gain, but rather the kind of weight you lose or gain. Hmm. You go out and deplete bone mass and you deplete muscle mass, you're going the wrong way. Right. And it's worse if you get out there and say, I'm going to lose, I, gee, I've lost five pounds of fat. Well, much of that will be negated if you've lost five pounds of lean at the same time. So that's the kind of thing I think we can address and make changes, and I think the world of nutritional supplements, I think that's going to make a difference. Now, let me go through, when I go through these slides, some of these slides are very, very busy. Let me just hit the high points on them. David will have a copy of them. I don't know what the distribution is of, of the slides, but certainly he can provide you with them. And I want to be clear in the beginning, saying, you know, that, yeah, I'm out, my goal here and so forth is to, is to see to what extent I can follow uh, David's lead on his goal, but this is the goal of our company. Essentially, we do three things in the company. We do consult, we do R&D, and we sometimes even joint venture with companies that lack in-house resources to conduct their own R&D. Second thing we do is we do some on-site corporate and organizational wellness programs. That includes, you know, the use of state-of-the-art measurements of quality of life, blood chemistries, and body composition are lean and fat. And this is the word that Sherry talked about, testing of mobile DEXA. Now, DEXA stands for, don't take notes on this, you don't care, dual <laughs> energy x-ray absorptiometry. I mean, come on, you can't even spell it, you know? 
Yeah. It took me three years to spell it. What it essentially means, it's a low-level x-ray that measures the composition of your body to tell you how much bone, how much lean, how much fat you have, and where it is. I'll, I'll, I'll talk more about that later. Third thing we do is we do independent clinical trials for third-party validation for the safety and efficacy of products. I don't know if it's good news or not, but, you know, one of the things we did was we did become a public company, you know, we're, we're trading there as IHTI. I mean, I don't know if that's a good news, good move or not, but in any case, we're stuck with it. So we're about to kind of launch some information in that area. Uh, I don't know if today's stock market's an invitation for anybody, but <laughs> we, we probably chose the wrong time to do it. But nonetheless, there we are. We've done it anyways, like it or not. Um, the goal of this presentation, let me be out front with this right from the beginning. I want to see to what extent I can do something that's compatible with the goals, you know, uh, with, with David's goals and Cherry's goals here, too. Okay, that's, so that's number one. Hopefully I can pull it off and make that contribution. The second thing is I really want to get out and recruit you for some clinical trials. And if you do that, I'm going to ask you to purchase some, some really state-of-the-art tests and they'll be at research prices, but they're going to be at the best you can get. And I think the feedback you will get from that, just getting the numbers and what it means, I think you'll find that it really does motivate you to make lifestyle changes. And that's something we found over and over again in our research. You give people good information from solid testing technology, it changes their behavior. It's a wake-up call. Now, last thing on here is I want to get my... I want to get my sales skills out here and see if there's any way I can pr have you purchase a copy of Restructuring Body Composition. That's a book I wrote last year. Now, it, it was on the longitudinal trial. Now, I know some of you people are involved with Manitech. Some are involved with World Body Care. Some are involved with other things. But look, you know, we did the longitudinal trial on, on the glyconutrients. But there's so much more information in the book that goes well beyond that. It's almost like we want to make certain points about health and wellness, and we just use the glyconutrients more as examples. I have no financial relationship with Manitech whatsoever. In terms of the income to our company, they're as, as small a bit player as we possibly could could have. Most of the research that we've done is from associates in that organization and other organizations going out and saying, I want these blood chemistry and body composition measurements, and I'm willing to purchase them and pay this reduced price. So in essence, a lot of this research, the major portion of it, is really people going out and doing their own due diligence about the nutritional programs they're on, using the best measurements to see if they can really figure out if it's a benefit to them or not. Did you have any? Did you have rigorous? I, I guess you, you gave them guidelines on how to use the nutritional products, though. No, most of what we, a lot of the research that we do is associated with simply saying, "Live your lifestyle the way it normally is," and we want to see what happens. Hmm. So we didn't do anything. To go out and try and make a change in someone's lifestyle is certainly one form of research. Clinical research we're doing is to say that to exercise this new trend in research, which is let's get people in the real world and see what happens when we give them a supplement in the real world under real world conditions. No one's going to go out there and make the same kind of changes typically that some research requires. So you wind up getting something and results of something in a very artificial environment that bears no relationship to the real world. Now, this is, uh, goes back again here, David. This is just a repeat of what we already had. I just want to kind of highlight all the, all the investigations we've done over the years have been tied to or supported by some of these men and women that are on this. From Dr. Proust, who's professor of medicine at Georgetown, he's now the president of the American College of Nutrition. Dr. Mahalik up there is co-chair of the Department of Statistics and Epidemiology, uh, former Agent Orange principal investigator, and so forth down the line here. The most important one for me, though, I've got down here at the bottom, and that's Christy Hobbs. She does spiritual intervention nutritional research in developing countries. And the reason she's that important is because she's my daughter. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it, 
she lost her husband a few years back and, and has just grown into a, a magnificent woman, woman now who's gone over and, and opened up an orphanage in Africa in Kenya. And they put their first 20-some kids into that orphanage the first of this year. She had the well dug, purchased the land. It was just amazing how much God directed her, you know, once, her, once she lost her husband to fulfill that same mission. So that's wow. my bias with respect to that. So she works with you there as well? Uh, the uh, no. No, she just, okay. she, she just works with her. The Mercy Foundation is the organization she works for. But, you know, we do work with her. We just provided some nutritional supplements for the kids to help them with their bone density, uh, with their bone growth. Okay. Now, so, I, know you, I know you're going to get to this in a minute, but I was, I was, when you mentioned bone density, I was actually at, a, at, a, at Borders, and uh, a lady walks up. I was speaking with a podiatrist an elderly podiatrist, and she, the lady walked up and says, well, what can I do about my osteoporosis? I'm losing, I'm losing bone and blah, blah, blah. And the podiatrist begins to pontificate pretty much and say, well, listen, there's nothing you can do about this when you get to be this age, blah, blah, blah. You just need to be philosophical about it and just live with what you have. In other words, there is nothing you can do. And I was just like cringing inside me, and I, I thought, surely there, there is something that can be done about bone density being improved at any age. What, what, what do you say, have to say about that? Well, I think probably that's the one thing when Sherry and I were talking about a woman's touch. I think that particular bias is results from a man's touch. We got a male-dominated medicine for so long a period of time. That's what the philosophy was. Well, it's just part of being a woman. You're getting old. You have to live with it. Totally out of, out of step with what reality says. We just finished one study on bone density. The person who had the best results was an 82-year-old woman. <laughs> we measured people from 30 years old up to 85 years old. There was absolutely no difference in any age group in the amount of gains they made when they followed the program that was outlined in the research study. Wow. So wow. I, I really think that, that we're bordering on malpractice when we tell the female patients and the few males, too. You know, certainly, you know, about 20% of males are going to face the same issues. But to say there's nothing you can do about it is just totally out of step with the research. It's unfair. Well, we took our guidelines over here from the National Institutes of Health to promote quality science in dietary supplements to validate unique mark, uh, biomarkers of dietary supplement effects on known endpoints. Now, you know, when I, when I read this thing, David, it doesn't say known endpoints of optimal health. It says known endpoints of chronic disease. But the problem is there's so much emphasis in the nutritional community now by the regulatory folks to suggest that dietary supplements should not be treated as medicine. I just took that chunk out. But here we have, you know, NIH telling us that we should go out and use dietary supplement research to help with disease, going back to osteoporosis. So what does it leave us with? If you improve bone density, are you helping someone with their osteoporosis? Oh, of course. Now, wait a minute. That's a disease claim. You can't make that claim. So the bottom line is the government is giving us something that if we follow what they're suggesting we do, we wind up violating the very principles that they're saying we can't violate or we shouldn't violate. Kind of pickle, so, isn't it? Yeah, well, I think the issue here is that's why, you know, for those of you there that are marketing products and involved with products, you know, that can help bone health, you know, stick with bone health. Let, let the person make connect the dots. You don't have to say osteoporosis. I mean, do you really think a woman out there or a man who's got osteoporosis is going to say, oh, he's talking about bone health, not osteoporosis? Not very likely. So stick with the thing that's consistent with the regulations. Stick with bone health. And believe me, people will take it to the next level themselves. We don't have to do that for them. Okay. Another thing we wanted to respond to was the Surgeon General's Bone Health Report that came out in 2004. And these are just a few statistics over here, but I think one of the dramatic ones is two-thirds of American adolescents are not receiving adequate bone-building nutrients for normal bone growth. And this is when 90% of their bone growth really occurs. About 20% of our senior citizens will suffer from a hip fracture you know, and die within a year of the fracture. 
20% will end up in a nursing home within a year. And hip fractures, you know, account for about 300,000 hospitalizations a year. And direct costs are something on the order of 18 billion a year. Much, much of that is something you can do something about. It is not, as the thing David was talking about, what he cringed about, it is not that you have to accept that as a consequence of aging. You do not. So to address that problem, the Surgeon General issued this call to action to the healthcare community. He said, get started by taking action in homes, healthcare settings, and community across our nation. Remember, going back to the point we made earlier, this is the Surgeon General. You are never too old or too young to improve your bone health through improved diets, improved health literacy. Haven't we talked about that a few minutes ago, about knowledge? Mm -hmm. And increased mm -hmm. physical activity. Notice the Surgeon General didn't say exercise. Now, I don't know if it was intentional or not, but our recommendation is don't start with increasing exercise. Start with increasing physical activity. I'll have more to say about that later. Now, the study we're going to talk about here, and I hope I don't offend some of the other people that are not marketing this product, but... You know, what we did was we wanted to use improved diets, and it was a lack of nutritional supplements, but you can put in there in general what this was, was nutritional supplements. Increased health literacy, you know, well, there's my ego in there, you know. That says, you know, the way we did it was we gave people a longitudinal trials book. And then physical activity, we asked people in a program and the research that we've done, everyone wears a what we call a clicker or a pedometer. And I'll, again, talk more about that. It is amazing how effective that is as a behavior modification tool. As long as you measure, you track, and you graph, it's almost automatic that it will change your behavior. Hmm. Uh, this is the book, you know, and I, you, know, you can give me a call over there. It's got a number at the bottom over here. But a lot of what I'll be talking about, you know, will be will be discussed in this book, and pardon my commercialism, but they tell us that even us independent researchers, you know, we can get pretty commercial when it comes to selling a book. I guess they allow us to have that ego trip. Oh, of course. Go ahead. And we, 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 um, Sherry will type in the numbers, too, so everybody can have it in the chat box as well. All so, right. You, you, okay. All right. Now, this is the general, the, over, this, the table of contents. A lot of you people that are in the nutrition business, you're going to have to make these distinctions too between structure and function claims and medical and disease claims. It's not an impossible hill to climb, but it's one you have to be careful of. It's one that, you know, I've seen so many people where they go out and they have someone take a nutritional supplement and they see what anyone would describe as a miracle. And they're supposed to go out now and, and just not say something about that? My neighbor took this product and her cancer went away. Now, it doesn't happen all the time. Of course not. But how do you get people who are selling a product that see major medical diseases reversed, how do you get them to be quiet? How do you get them to couch it in secondary language, like structure and function kinds of things? But that's your challenge. Mm -hmm. Chapter 2, we talked about the longitudinal trials. Chapter 3, we talk about DEXA technology, measuring instead of estimating. And the reason I said that is, you, is that almost all of the measurements of body fat are not measurements. Bioimpedance and skin fold calipers, all of them are estimates. What DEXA does is puts you on an open exam table. It scans your body at a low level of x-ray. It's even safe for infants in terms of it's one two hundredth of what you get in a year from normal sources that you'll encounter in your environment. It's a very thin pencil point beam that it goes over, and what it does, as I said earlier, it measures fat, lean, and bone and where it's distributed throughout your body. And we have significant research. If I just give you that report and sit down and explain it to you, if you're deficient in any of those three parameters, lean, bone, or, uh, or fat, you know, it's going to make a difference. Then Chapter 5, we talk more about bone mineral density, the pivotal mark, and then maintaining healthy lipids and CRP levels. And CRP, for those that are not familiar with it, is C-reactive protein, 
which is probably the darling of the, of the cardiovascular measurements now. Then the effects of glyconutritional plant sol polysaccharides on quality of life. Then I talk about the clicker, you know, what gets measured, gets tracked, and gets managed. The glycemic index and the glycemic load. I've, I know a lot of you people have seen the controversy over using the glycemic index and load, but the bottom line is if you look back over the research, you know, over the past decade, the research is certainly more positive of its value than it is negative. And then the last thing, you're, one of your least favorite subjects is how do you estimate your caloric intake. I'm not sure people will ever track their caloric intake, but you know, you might estimate it. Might be a simple way to do it. We go through that in the book. Longitudinal trial research over here. You know, I, I could even scratch out this Manatech up here and say, it is clear from all of the research that we've done that nutritional supplements can improve bone health by increasing bone density. It can aid in the reduction of excess fat and help maintain or increase lean. It can increase self-reported quality of life and improve the immune system as measured by c reactive the protein, which I know is an inflammatory measurement, but it certainly is a good marker of improved immune functioning, which is pretty much what we've said down there at the bottom about the biomarkers, you know, that saying taking these supplements can improve immune health. Now, if, in terms of getting the book, here's another number from Health Tech Products. They're also selling the book. And this is more of my nepotism ink over here because this is another one of my daughters over here that and we, we set her up in the business, and she just waited till we found something that really worked. And I said, well, I'm not going to tell you that until you get it out there and sell my book as well. So I conned her into doing it. But that's another number we can go. That's the best number, as a matter of fact, to get it. She actually sells them for us. Uh, okay. It's actually kind of at the bottom of my screen. Is that 210-274-6193? Uh, I don't know, David. Say it again. 210-274-6193. Uh, one more time, you want to say it? <laughs> <laughs> I got him, Cherry, you have to admit. <laughs> you got me, you got me. You got <laughs> yes, me. that's the right number, sure. Uh, okay, and we, because we have some people who are actually calling in and who cannot see the screen, so it's a good thing. It's a good thing uh, you made me say it a couple of times, too. <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, you can give them a copy of this PowerPoint, can't you, David? Aren't you going to open sure, and give them that? Sure, sure. Well, yeah, okay. okay. As long okay. as you give it to us. Yes, you got it. You you can count on it. Sure. Okay, good. And this is Thank just a, the statement of what we did with the longitudinal trials. Here's an update to the book. This was our goal in the book, okay, was, was, you know, for you people that are in the nutritional business, you know, even if you're not getting the miracles, look about on this little diagram over here where if you can do interventions just to improve body composition, reduce some fat, increase some lean, and maintain or increase bone, you're going to gradually have people go down this line over here, this green line, instead of coming down this red line and entering in this. Uh, this is pretty much of a health span over here, and this is of the average person, and this is the disability zone. Mm -hmm. And what we're saying is I think the contribution you can make to human welfare is even if you make small changes here, realize that those changes and the people persist in making those things, you can make some enormous differences here in terms of their lifespan, but even more importantly, you'll be making differences in the quality of life as indicated by these green cross marks in here. So don't get discouraged if it looks like the change that you're making and so forth is minor. You need to project, project it out in the long term, and you'll be make, maybe making major contributions to people's well-being. Structure and function claims over here, you know, We've talked about that. Stay away from the disease claims that suggest, you know, you can cure, mitigate, treat, or prevent disease. Structure and function. That's the beauty of doing body composition. Changing lean, changing fat, and changing bone are structure and function changes. Maintaining, maintaining healthy cholesterol levels, maintaining a healthy immune system. Those are structure and function changes, and you don't have to get into the suggestion of how much it may help with cardiac disease or with cancer. Oh, here's an update over here. This is, a, this is an article. I just got a call back from the journal, as a matter of fact, yesterday on this. This is a, uh, a 
a study or an editorial that we just wrote that was accepted for publication in the Journal of the American College of Nutrition. And it's, it, it talks about a major grant coming into the nutrition industry today, $1.1 billion, for something called the Comparative Effectiveness Research. You know, and, and our editorial was about opportunities and challenges for the nutritional industry. Once you can check with David, once that gets into print, we can certainly send you a copy of that. But it, what, it, what it is, the change is really this. When you go out and you try and prove, it proves the best word, that a product really works, you use it and compare it to a placebo. So the FDA and much of the scientific community has simply said, does this product work better than taking a sham product or taking a product that has no effect? Now, then someone else comes along, and they also get another product that does the same thing, and another one, and another one. So then you get a bunch of Me Too products out here, but all of them have passed the bar, so to speak, passed muster by going out and saying, okay, we, we did better than nutritional. I mean, we did better than a placebo group. Well, you know, if we're going to be doing anything to address our health care costs, we need to hold the research community and the nutritional community responsible for saying, hey, let us know if you've got something that's better. Don't just focus on the whole notion over here of doing something that's associated with, I apologize for that, don't be going and doing something here that, that just is another Me Too product. Let's just go out and do something that is actually better or has better effect or healthier effects than what we already have on the market. That's what comparative effectiveness research is about. Mm -hmm. And in that article, it's interesting, I cited a study we did on AIDS patients which really illustrates the structure and function claim. When AIDS patients take the medication, to help them manage their AIDS, the medication has a disastrous effect often on their lean mass, on their bone density, and it tends to shift their body fat from the central cavities into the peripheral to where they get lumps and bumps on their shoulders. We put people on a nutritional product, and our involvement was only to measure them. So we measured them in January of one year, came back a year later and measured them again during the time that they took a nutritional supplement designed to improve body composition. And all these bar graphs show if, it's, if they're going up, it's good news. If they're going down, it's bad news. So up is associated with gains of lean in these different areas over here, not losses. So if you notice, their arms, legs, trunk, ribs, pelvis, and spine, as well as their total, everything increased by taking that supplement combating some of those negative effects of the medication. And for the statisticians, you'll notice we got significance levels on the trunk, the, the ribs, uh, and total, and almost got it on the spine. Well, that study is cited in this comparative effectiveness research as an example of making the distinction between structure and function and disease claims. So these patients were all AIDS patients who were taking yes. AIDS drugs, and then That's you correct. gave and then uh, what kinds of nutritional supplementation did you get, have them taken? In this one, they were taking the glyconutritionals for a year. Just the glyconutritionals, any antioxidants, vitamins, minerals, what else? No, uh, again, the, the major variable was taking those, and they left them to take whatever ever nutrients they wanted to. They didn't try and control them and say, you only take glyconutrients. Okay. So the question is, there may be some people in this thing who didn't, with the glyconutrients had nothing to do with it. They just went out and took other kinds of supplements that helped them. Okay. Point we're so making the, is, go ahead. So they had, um, there was no record of what, what else they were taken? No, well, the record wasn't available to us, no. Got it, okay. So the but point I, but I, think, yeah, I think the message here, Dave, is something else. Here's something, you know, that again, for years people are saying, these are the consequences of being treated with this medication if you have AIDS. Turns out not to be the case. Nutritional supplements can, in fact, make a difference. Goes back to the story about the osteoporosis too. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yep. This is just a summary of what's in the rest of the chapters we went over before. Um, 
body composition, the gains. Well, let me move on to the next one over here. And here's an interesting slide. You know, back in 04, they they got a bunch of what we what we like to think were the gurus, and the American Medical Association had a summit on obesity in Chicago, and they invited us there to to come and present our research and what our to try and develop a position that the AMA would take with regard to obesity. And what they're saying is that dysfunctional, see that's what we got to say in medicine, you know. We can't say, you know, no good body composition. We got to say dysfunctional, okay? You got to use a big word, huh? Yeah, oh, yeah, you got to, man. That's where you get these PhDs for, it, you know. So dysfunctional body composition is a powerful accelerator of over 40 different diseases. And if you go around this whole disease cycle over here, you're going to see almost all of the major degenerative diseases, all of which can be improved by improving your body composition. That's the message from that chart. And body Here's composition. An is, is body, body composition, is. going back to this, meaning if you, the, it, the dysfunctional means that you have too much fat, so it leads to obesity. You have too little lean. That leads to sarcopenia. We'll talk about that later. And you have decaying bone density, which leads to osteopenia and osteoporosis. So those those three disorders are, are what they're calling disorders or dysfunctional body composition. You know, has a major effect by accelerating all these different disease states. Got it. Here's an example. Is it? Is it? This is a chart published in this little known journal over here called the New England Journal of Medicine. Okay. And and what they did here, they wanted to go out and say, you know, if your body fat is above a certain level, how much does that increase your chances of dying from cancer once you have it? So if you look at the top of this chart, it says that the woman has has a multiple myeloma up here. It means that she's got almost one and a half times the chance of dying from cancer as opposed to somebody who is not over fat. Look at colon erecting cancer right with it. But then you come clear down, you look at gallbladder, and you come down to uterine cancer down here at the bottom. If you're over fat and you, you have uterine cancer, you are 6.2 times more likely to die from that cancer than people who are not over fat. Oh now, that ought to be a profound wake-up call for folks when they see those figures. And similar figures are available for males as well. Hmm. Here's the American solution to the fat problem, okay? Yeah, you just go out there, you see, and you get this device over here, you know, that this inch master, and you go back and you take your jeans and you keep stretching them out, you know, by <laughs> twisting this little knob over here. And you want to tell you folks, man, I, I'm still wearing the same jeans I wore when I was in high school. <laughs> and if you really want to chub up, you know, you can go up here in the corner and get these extenders over here, man, and it'll even push this rascal out even further. <laughs> Probably, this is an actual product that was marketed, you know. Probably not the most effective way to increase your health, I wouldn't think, or to improve it. And then we're back to this principle we talked about before. It is not the kind, not the amount of weight, or it is the kind, not the amount of weight one loses that sets the pathway to optimal health. It is essential to establish a personalized healthy goal weight to wrap the, through the reduction of excess fat while maintaining or increasing lean and bone density. That's the key to optimizing your health when you're changing your body composition. You know, when I was going through my training and everything, we always thought that, you know, well, body fat's like a, like a storage bucket over there, and we just put stuff in it. When we, when we burn up more calories than we're taking in, I admit, a rare event, that what we do is we go to the bucket and take that fat out and run our bodies based on what we draw from that. Well, the latest research is suggesting more and more now that's not the case. What it's suggesting is we should start viewing body fat as an end organ in and of itself that exudes, uh, inf that exudes chemicals into the body that make it worse. So instead of it being a storage tank, it's actively involved in the creation of fat, and the fatter you are, the fatter you're going to get because storage body fat 
uh, has an inherent part of the whole process. There is some new research, too, suggesting that bone health is the same thing. It's not just bones that are off the side, you know, that we gain or lose over time. It ties into the entire health of the body and all health systems. So as your body fat goes down, your body gets healthier. As your bone density goes up, your body fat gets healthier. Are you saying that the fat and the bone actually take a, play an active role in me metabolism, hormonal balance, and other things? That's exactly what I'm saying. They wow. exude pathogens into the body that exacerbate, here's a nice cute word, make worse the existing conditions that you have. Yeah, you know, we think you get so many fat cells and that's it. They either get full or empty. That's not true. The fatter you are, the more the body generates new fat cells. So you're so when you're getting over fat, your body produces more and more cells, which aggravates the whole situation. And then it exudes these pathogens into the body that aggravates it further. Huh. So fat is not just extra bulk you're moving around. That's how your, your heart has to pump against uh, extra bulk. We're not just talking about bulk now. We're talking about an active uh, chemical interaction. Here. That's correct. Wow. That's correct, that it actually plays an active role in, uh, in disease functions throughout the body. And a similar thing now is, is seems to be happening in bone. We all know, well, maybe we all don't, but that, that we replace all the calcium in our body every seven years. So whatever calcium you have today, you're not going to have any of it in seven years from now. Because it's all going to be replaced. And in that replacement process, it works with all systems in the body. So now you're beginning to see research that's viewing both body fat and bone as endocrine organs instead of viewing them as storage tanks, if you will. Oh, wow. Now, this is the state-of-the-art technology that we use in measuring both body fat and bone density. And what it does is it starts here, I think you can see this arrow right below the chin. I realize if you don't have the slide capability, you can't. But it starts right below the chin and it goes back and forth across your body. And what we do is we measure as it's going back and forth. You just do nothing. And some of you folks are great at that, man. You just lay there and do nothing. It's like you've got PhDs in nothingness or something. There's some guys in the Army, man, they love coming and getting the test because the first time people left them alone for 15 minutes. <laughs> and so, but you've got to be careful because this is probably as nude as anyone is ever going to see you, you know, over here. But we don't really do the head up here. We don't measure the bone. We, we had some, it wasn't politically correct because we had some couples who would say, you know, yeah, look, I knew you were a bonehead or an airhead or a fathead. So we wanted to get rid of that family strife. So we just use it from the chin down. In each of these areas. <laughs> then we break it out and into each of the different areas of your body because it's possible you could have good bone health overall, but you could still have one real bad area in your body, so we try and identify that one as well. But it's an open exam table is showing you on this lady over here, you know, that it just goes back and this scanner goes back and forth. The whole thing takes about fifteen minutes. It's an FDA-approved measure and considered by most researchers as being the gold standard for this kind of measurement. How much does that test cost? Well, it depends on where you're, where you're going to get it. When, when we do them on site for people, we charge $75 for it. We've had people tell us it's anywhere from 200 on up when they take it, you know, uh, either with, with or without their insurance companies. Hmm. But I think, you know, that that they're cutting back on health care now, so I think it's becoming a little more reasonable. But, you know, it, I would think if there's any way you can get one of these measurements, I would strongly recommend it. I, you know, our research shows it's a real wake-up call when someone comes to you and say, here's the actual number of pounds of fat that you have on your body, here's where your lean is being depleted, and here's an indication over here where you're likely to have a fracture. People just don't ignore that kind of information, particularly when it's derived from a technology that's as good as you can get it right now. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a major behavior modification device. Let me show you an example here of, of something. I can tell you in my database, we, have, we did this on 15,000 different people where we looked at what conclusion would you draw if you looked at how their scale weight changed versus how their body composition changed during a weight loss intervention. All right? Now, 
Here's one where someone participates in a study and they come out and their scale weight had increased by one pound. And they said, man, this is not an effective program. Man, I'm fatter now than I was when they came in. But what they don't realize is and didn't realize until they got the DEXA measurement was they actually lost three pounds of fat and gained four pounds of lean. So the positive changes in their composition of their body was three pounds of fat's a positive change and four pounds of lean is a positive change. So their body composition improvement index or the benefit they got from the intervention was really seven pounds. And yet this person thought they failed because they only had a or had a one pound gain. That's how this information on scale weight versus body composition can really distort the results. And, and I can tell you, as I say, I'm not exaggerating. We have thousands of examples like this in the database. Here's another one. person says, well, I lost a couple of pounds, but, you know, well, it was worthwhile to have done it. But look what happened. This person gained four pounds of metabolically active lean, I mean fat, and lost six pounds of lean. Your metabolism is directly determined by the amount of lean mass you carry. If you had a measurement of your lean mass and multiplied it times 12, that gets you pretty close to most people's metabolism. So what they've done is they've reduced their metabolic action or their metabolism and increased the amount of pathogens into their body, which was totally obscured by this two-pound weight loss, when in reality they were 10 pounds worse off at the end of this intervention than they were in the beginning. But because the scale weight didn't measure and didn't distinguish these changes over here, you know, it totally distorted this outcome. We don't know how many studies on nutritional supplements, you know, have really been set aside because they just use scale weight. Right, right. Oh, people need to know about this. Now, do you, all this information you have in your book? Yes, indeed. I'm sorry, what did you say, David? I was like, people need to know about this. No, no, get to the last <laughs> half of that sentence is what I was saying. Okay, I'll, I'll say it. Do you have all this information in your oh, book? Oh, yes, yes, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> yeah, but you know, look, I, I can't tell you. When, when, when you see people, another thing we find out in this thing is I can recall something that almost brought tears to my eyes. I had a... I had a gal who was about 29 or 30, you know, and we measured her, and what we found was she had an extremely high level of lean. She was really solid. Mm -hmm. and, she, and when I looked at that and said, you know, a goal weight for you is somewhere around 155 pounds. There's, you, you basically can't get much lower than that. And she started crying because she said all throughout her teenage years, her coaches, her parents, her friends, all of them were encouraging her to lose weight so she could get down to about 120 pounds. This woman will never get to 120 pounds. She spent her entire teenage years chasing a fantasy of being a 120-pound girl. And everyone was doing it with well intentions, you know. They, and then every time she hit 150 or 160, her weight would level off, like the body was sort of saying, you're not going to burn any lean from this point down. And everyone then began saying, oh, you're cheating, you're falling off the program, and so forth. And that, of course, you know, got her to the point of being depressed, which, of course, you know, she went out and solved that by eating some more food, and her weight started going back up again. One wonders, you know, what would happen if when we get to large women, what would happen if during their teenage years we could simply say, you need to learn how to live as a large woman in a culture that's obsessed with smallness in their women. But this gal never learned that because she was distracted by going after this fantasy of being a 120-pound person that was never going to happen. So she wasted that experience and that learning experience. And I can tell you, so many people we see who are overweight normally have relatively high levels of lean, and it looks to us like a lot of them were, 
or genetic in nature. Right, right. Well, well that is so liberating for, for people to know about because, like you said, I mean, they're bombarded everywhere from TV to family to friends to society. Everything is against them understanding what you've just mentioned. Yeah, and look, you know, what's this TV show? You know, this TV show goes out, and it's the biggest loser. Right. What do, what do they measure? Scale weight. Well, what happens if these people are going out here and losing lean? I right. mean, you could look at an anorexic patient, and you can say, boy, an anorexic patient is really losing, you know, weight. They're really successful. But when you look at it, they're losing a lot of lean. So the number one cause of death for an anorexic patient is cardiac arrest. Why? Because the body consumes and cannibalizes its own lean, including the cardiac muscle. Right. So it right. looks like they're getting fitter, but what they're doing is they're destroying the cardiac muscle in the process. Mm. You go out and look at weight loss drugs. Now, I could be wrong on this because I might be a little out of date, but you know, I went back and scanned and looked at all the information on the weight loss drugs that have been approved over the years. And I could not find one single study where they looked at the effect of the weight loss drug on fat, lean, and bone. Mm. The outcome measure was all scale weight. I know people, you know, all the time they say, yeah, I've heard that over and over again. You know, here, look here, Doc, I don't care how much it is. As long as it's 10 pounds off me, I don't care where it comes from. <laughs> well, you better care where it comes from. Yeah. Because yeah. you're really jeopardizing your health if you're losing lean and bone instead of just losing fat. Right. Sarcopenic obesity, okay? Confluence of two epidemics. Let me just say what this is. This is the progressive loss of lean with age. This is something that people think is a normal process of aging, but our very culture sets it up so we allow people, even encourage them to become frail as they age, and, and sometimes with the best intentions. I mean, you look out there and you see your neighbor, you know, she's 72, and she's struggling with her garbage can to put it out in front of her house. You know, when you go out there like a good neighbor and say, here, Helen, let me help you with that. Now, people start doing that all the time with Helen, so Helen becomes less and less active and begins to lose lean. And that's the thing that's going to lead to her, her frailty. I mean, you want to be a good Christian? Go out there and tell Helen to come get your garbage can and put it out there, too. You know, That would really be a, a more Christian thing to do than going out because, you see, you see that, look at this last line. This is what astounded me. Earlier I said that 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 poor bone density was costing the culture 18 billion a year. Look at what it costs from the cost associated with frailness and disability and loss of independence in the elderly. Remarkably, the same figure. It's 18 billion a year associated with our loss of lean as we age. Something that does not have to happen. Look look at this over here. This is. Here's women ages 55 to 64, 40% of them can't pick up a 10-pound grandchild. 45% of them in 65 and 74 can't do it, and by the time they hit 75 to 84 over here, almost two-thirds of them can't pick up a 10-pound baby huh. or weight. That's like a, a two-year-old? Yeah. No, that's probably, no, well, no, that's less than a two-year-old. That's yeah, like uh, sure. Little, you figure the average weight is seven pounds at birth, you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. Golly. You know, and, and the bottom line is it doesn't have to happen. That's where you people that are in the nutrition business, if you can focus your nutritional supplements on maintaining lean in the elderly, you can make an enormous contribution to the quality of their life. Mm. And this business of thinking that increasing lean is the purview of of teenagers and weightlifters and so forth, you know, that's just such a poor way to look at the notion of trying to build lean. We want to build lean because we want to make people healthier and keep them out of the hospital, you know, as they age. And here's a classic example of what an effect it can have. Here's the crisis in bone health in America. It goes back again. Here's our DEXA measurement that we use for measuring bone density as well. 
Now here's, here's an example of going back and looking at the thing that David remarked about very early in our discussion this evening. We went out and we did a study on almost a thousand people. Now these are people who are taking glyconutrients. And I don't think glyconutrients have the world patent on nutritional supplements. I mean, I haven't compared them with others, but I think you should look at this as, as the power of nutritional supplements, not just glyconutrients. But we, what we did in this study was we went out, don't worry about what the numbers mean. We expected the bone density to go down this on the left based on the age of these people. When we tracked them over this program, we expected the normal change of bone density would be they lose a little. This was a control group, this next group over here, this one that's 131 people in it. And those were people who we simply gave them a wake-up call. We said, here's your bone density. You really need to do something about it or you don't. And they went out independently and did something only as a function of getting their results. We didn't do anything for them. And instead of losing this much bone, they gained this much. Here's a group went out and took three different forms of dietary supplements from three nutritional companies. And what they found was in this case, taking these dietary supplements over here led to an even greater increase than this control group who really had nothing. The next group was a group of people who had a placebo, but they followed the recommended program with the clicker or with the pedometer, and as they did in all of these groups up here, and even on the placebo, which I don't fully understand, these people <laughs> actually did so much better, you know, just as the function of taking the placebo as opposed to doing nothing. Apologize for my that. phone ringing. Even better than dietary supplements, huh? Yeah, I, I, I don't get that. I, you know, I, I, I never have been able to understand that bar. This one over here, this green one, was something we did where we went out and what we wanted to do was this was going to be our reference group. This was, these people worked out three times a week in a fitness club or a fitness center. And it was Bally's and a couple of down here in San Antonio, too. And what they did was they got the wake-up call because we gave them the results in the beginning. They also got uh, these, this pedometer to track their steps over this period of time, and they took the supplement in the, in, the, in the clubs, and we paid the personal trainer based on their compliance, and they did the best of all. Then we had this very strange outcome over here with almost 200 people. These were people who got the, uh, the basic wake-up call, they wore the pedometer and did that program, and they took glyconutrients, and look at the enormous jump in their bone density. Wow. None of our co-investigators could believe it, so we took all the information out of the database, and we put it in again, and it came out exactly the same. So there was no question in our mind that when we looked at these groups over here, that nutritional supplements contribute enormously. Because, you know, look, it benefited all of these people except in the placebo group here. Of course, the concern that you're going to raise about this is, yeah, but with these weren't placebo randomly assigned groups. Well, here's another one over here where we took glyconutrients and we ran them against a control group, different supplements that lost a little. We ran them against the placebo and the expected change. And you'll notice now in a double-blinded, placebo-controlled study, we still found that these glyconutrients led to an increase in bone. Hmm. So they work. They work. This is sort of a publication update. The results of that study, in addition to being in the book, we also published that results in, a, in the uh, uh, journal called The Original Internist. If anyone wants that reference, you can call David. I'll get it for him. You know, in fact, we can give you copies of that. The, the journal said we can do it as long as we reference their, uh, the journal in the process. But that summarizes some of the same material in the book, those two charts I just showed you. And is this information in your book? Oh, yeah, I love you, David. You, 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 <laughs> I, I carry on, don't I? Yeah. Now, all of that information is in the book, and it's repeated in this original internist article. This is just nothing more than an extract out of the book. Okay. Here's another study we just finished right now, and this is a, a study we also just referenced in that uh, paper. We just got accepted for publication, and this particular study now 
is in for, has been submitted for publication as well. You know, I don't know how many of the nutritional companies are talking about uh, Dan Burton's, uh, their uh, representative from Indiana. That that I, I don't know, uh, David, are you and are, are you guys familiar with that? He went out and he's proposing a House regulation that suggests that nutritional supplements be a tax deductible item. No, I'm going, we're not familiar with that. Is this a senator? No, he's a representative in the U.S. Oh, House yeah. of Representatives. Dan Burton, he's been a real supporter of nutritional supplements now for any number of years. And he's introduced this bill. He just introduced it about a month ago. You know? mm. and, and I'm sending him all of this stuff plus a copy of the book and so forth. You know, some of the nutritional companies are saying, you know, write Representative Burton and thank him for his interest in supplements and his support. Uh, well, I did that, and I'm also sending him a copy of the book and some of this research that we've done. This is a study also on bone density over here with another nutritional product. And what we did here was this was the expected change. And this goes back and directly addresses the kind of thing that David talked about in the beginning. This was the expected change during a, a one-year change in bone density. We expected it to go down almost 1%. These were the people who took a, a plant source form of calcium called algae cal. Uh, and they took that formula, and we noticed that instead of having this 7%, 0.7% drop, they had a 2.2 gain. Then we took the final formula over here, and we took that formula and said, okay, let's have them take this algae cow, which was an advanced form of it. It had more nutrients than this, and their bone gain was 3.1%. I mean, these are dramatic changes in bone density. Then we took the groups over here, and we said, okay, Let's take this group over here who did the basic formula before they upgraded it, and let's add glyconutrients to it. So if you compare bar graph 2 with bar graph 4, you can see what a difference it makes when they added the glyconutrients, which reinforces our previous findings. Then if you take the final enhanced version over here and you added glyconutrients, notice it went up to 4.4%. That is a staggering number for an increase in bone density over a year. That gets close to and approaches the pharmaceutical ranges. Oh, excuse me, you said the yeah. pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical drugs can, can give you that amount of bone density improvement? Yeah, you know, I, I think in, in spite of all of us that, you know, and, and probably every listener that's on the line here today, you know, as much as we may resist pharmaceutical products and so forth, clearly, they provide some benefits. I can tell you now that, that it's almost impossible to derive benefits from nutritional supplements so far that will match the changes you get when you take pharmaceuticals. On this, and saying the same thing, I can also say you'll find very few nutritional supplements that are going to have the same side effects that the pharmaceuticals are going to have too. So, you know, you... You're, it's going to have a more profound effect on your body, Fosomax and some of these other medications, you know. But there also is a much greater chance that you're going to have adverse side effects when every bit of information we looked at on this plant source form of calcium over here, algae cal, that there was no side effects at all on blood chemistries, quality of life, you know, during the course of the study that we did. So these one-year changes, you know, are really a tribute to a plant source form of calcium. In fact, I would recommend uh, that same number you had, David, earlier on health tech development, you know, go back and it would, I would encourage folks to get that formula and add it to whatever nutritional supplement you're taking. Where, where, think, where can they get algae cal from? Yeah, they can get that from that same telephone number, Julie's number. Call Julie at the number I gave you before, the 274 number. Okay. That's okay. uh, two one two one zero two seven four six one nine three. That'll work. That's for the book and for the algae call. You got it. And okay. and to call and give me good strokes about a good person. No, never mind. Yeah, that too. That too. We, we'll we'll send you emails as well. <laughs> okay. All right. Let me get into blood chemistries over here too, which is really an extension to this. This is something that I encourage everyone to do because of the thing on the bottom, what gets measured gets managed. This is our 44-item blood chemistry test and includes this, the thyroid as well as C-reactive protein. 
So what we do, this is about a $400 test, and I, actually more than that, because occasionally when our research subjects go out and turn this into the lab, they give in their Social Security number, and all of a sudden they get a bill for $450 or $60. Uh, what our procedure here is, it'll, is that we sell them the, the requisition for $100, and they go back to a lab in their area. We have a national account. So it's going to be pretty rare that anyone that wants to get this test done uh, can't call us and get the requisition for up from us and go to a lab in their area, and then they send us the report. Now, the catch is if we're going to give it to you for $100, you have to let us use your data in our database. So as long as we're doing that, we get this research price, and we can give you a good price on that, and we can also make some contribution to science by putting it into the database. C-reactive protein, as I said earlier, is one of the darlings of the cardiac business. And what it seemed, what we found was down here is that 50% of all heart attacks occur in people with normal cholesterol levels. Cardio CRP improves this prediction. Now, when I say what we found, I didn't find it. This is a group of people up at Harvard. And what they found was that normally when you age, you begin to build up a little plaque inside the artery over here. And as you build up this plaque or cholesterol more and more, it ultimately leads to a blockage over here, and you have a cardiac event. Well, the reason 50% of people who have heart attacks they occur in normal people is because some people get an inflammation inside the artery over here, which makes this cholesterol pile up in one place much more than it normally would. So what cardio CRP predicts is it predicts inflammation within the artery that's going to put you at greater risk because it not only measures the cholesterol itself, but it gives you a probability that cholesterol is going to stick to the interior portion of the artery and build up in one place. So there really is an enormous amount of research on CRP, and I still think the weight of it is positive, and clearly it's something I think of great value when you take the blood test. So this is a Here's little an beside. Go ahead. Huh? This is a little. This is a little beside the point. But what you're saying, uh, or what we're finding out, is that um, heart disease is not as much a matter of chole high cholesterol, but more a question of inflammation. That's correct. Fifty percent of people. You have some people that come in with really low cholesterol levels, 170, and they have a heart attack. You have others who are up in the 300 range; they never have a heart attack. So how do you explain that? And the way you explain that is because of this, and you can use the C-reactive protein, gives you a measure of the extent to which that inflamed artery is going to upset the odds, if you will. I just did this little bar graph thing here to indicate the relative, the relative predictability of each one of these measures of, of heart disease. And C-reactive protein, you'll notice, came out the highest of all, a better predictor than total to HDL ratio, total cholesterol, LDL, homocysteine, and HDL. What this chart's designed to show is that C-reactive protein is a better predictor of heart disease than any of these other lipid measurements. I want to get now to, my, to the thing that I think is one of the more exciting things I've seen recently. <clears throat> I want to make a really profound statement here, and that is that I have never seen any research that has consistently supported any product or any measure as the research on vitamin D3. Vitamin D3, I've watched this for years now, and it keeps growing and growing, and there are no reversals. And I think you can clearly say the higher you're circulating D3 in your body, the less likely you are to fracture bones, lose muscle strength, become diabetic. Look at all of these disorders that are associated with your vitamin D level in your body. Hmm. I mean, and, and you know, I could show you every one of these studies that we've gone through this thing, and this is about five years worth of research. And you know, one of the questions we ask is, hey, how could this happen? How could we have missed this for so long? And the answer to the question is we missed it because nobody can make money on vitamin D. Yeah. I mean, it's almost, say it's free, but it's so inexpensive. And certainly you can bet the pharmaceutical folks are not going to be wild about it when it can provide these benefits instead of the pharmaceuticals. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
So what we're doing is we're, we we found that the glyconutrients, for example, you know, they had a positive effect on C-reactive protein from the research we've done. So what we're trying to do now is to see if we can build up the measurements of D in our database over here. And now, careful, folks, I'm going to try and pitch something to you here. You know, that this test is normally 270 but you can take it 126 for $126 if you call us at our number here at the research center. As long as we can use your data in our longitudinal trials, we can give you a requisition where you can fast for 12 hours in your hometown, go out and get your vitamin D measured. This is something I have insisted that every one of my daughters do, and that's five of them. Oh, wow. To go, to go out and take this measurement, and I'm saying it's one of the least expensive changes that you can make. Again, a good source of vitamin D is that same number that Julie had that we had before, or you can get it from any one of the health food stores. The only thing about vitamin D is, <coughs> is occasionally it, it really won't have what it says it has on the label. People frequently ask me, well, what do you think of this research? What do you think the appropriate level of D is? Well, look, the starting point is get out here and find out what your D level is to be begin with. What's your circulating D, and let's face it on that. I think that the weight of the research suggests that probably a daily amount, instead of being 800 IUs, it seems to me the research is much more supportive of the benefits of up to 2,000 IUs a day, and I see no evidence that you're going to have any adverse effects from vitamin D by taking as much as 10,000 IUs a day. That's almost more than 10 times what we have previously thought was an appropriate level of D. And if, um, and if go ahead. Go ahead. Um, so some some companies kind of have in their products five thousand international units on, on, a, on a daily basis. So yeah, I mean, that, I, I agree. We're, 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 we're trying to get someone to go and do a presentation on, on vitamin D specifically because of just the the sheer load, like you mentioned, of uh, research that's out there that supports this wonderful nutrient. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's just surprised. First time I saw these studies, you know, I just paid a little attention to it, but I'm astounded. And there are some great articles. If people get and take this test, you know, we'll send you some, some good summary articles that tell you the whole story about vitamin D. And, and I will assure you, you get this measurement and you find out your vitamin D is low, you're going to go on and do something about it. So all they need to do is call you on that number, and, and then you, you can show them where they can do the test. No, what, also. Yeah, what they do is they call us and we get their credit card or check, whatever, and, and we send them a requisition. And maybe they're up in Bangor, Maine. They take uh -huh. that requisition and go into a Quest lab there. They draw the blood there. Quest sends it to us. We put it in the database and send a copy back to the person. How long does that take? It takes anywhere from one to two weeks. In some okay. cases, we get them back in a week. Okay. And, and folks, again, for those... Uh, for those of them, just if you're just listening on the phone, the number again is two one zero eight two four 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 two zero zero. That's two one zero eight two four forty two hundred. Okay, and and look, folks, we're not going to get rich on this vitamin D measurement over here, but I really do, as poetic as it sounds, I really do think you can make a contribution to science and to human health to by taking these measurements that we've recommended. I mean, in building this database that we have over here. We think it's going to give us a lot of great information about relationship between different medical measurements that we've taken over time. This is the informed consent. We send you an informed consent to take the blood test. This is the complete panel uh, that doesn't include the D, so you'd have to add the D to that. But yeah, it was a $436 panel I think we used that gives you the 44 chemistries. Okay, here's the American definition of exercise. It's the art of converting big meals and fattening snacks into back strains and pulled muscles by lifting heavy things that don't have to be lifted in the first place or running when no one's chasing you. <laughs> you go out is, and is try... This, is this Huh? Is this, <laughs> this, is, is this Webster's? Yeah, this is Gilster. <laughs> <laughs> you go out and you try and get people to exercise, you better remember they have that mindset. So we have found that the best way to avoid that is this thing we call the clicker over here that you put on your belt 
and it tracks your clicks and your steps throughout the whole day. It will track your steps, show you the calories burned, which is really a bell and a whistle, no one uses it, and tracks the miles that you've traveled. But it's a clear behavior change if what you do is figure out what you're doing now, then you can graph these things, or if you do nothing else, but you know, I, I know some people will buy these things, and I'll, I'll talk to them six months later and say, "Well, how are you doing on it?" Say, well, it's on my, it's sitting on my chest of drawers at home. So we ask them, "Well, how many clicks a day is your chest of drawers getting?" You know, and they give you this quizzical look. <laughs> I would defy you to go out and use a little chart that comes with this too. When you get this, when it, one of these, you know, just the best one, and I would push push it toward that same two seven four number over to get one of these things. But if you go out and you track this information over here, I'll defy you to, if you do it every day, to maintain the same level. It's not going to happen. What's going to happen is just what's shown on this chart. This is someone who was a non-believer. They went out. We said, okay, here's where you're, here's where we're recommending that you go, and the maximum you'll get is this. They tracked it, and this is this we've seen over and over again with research subjects, and they. I, essentially increase and increase this line to they're well above even the minimums after a period of time. Providing you wear it, you write it down, and in most cases, if you go through and you track it as well. Here, look at this. This is an example of how much benefit you get by adding somewhere between 3,000 to 600 clicks a day. Remember, a click is a step. You get about 100 a minute. So this is about 30 minutes to an hour. Now look, folks, I know you don't have the time to do that. That's not the answer here. The answer is look at the number of ways that you can move during the day and accumulate these clicks where you're not taking any time out of your day. This is the first time I've used this women, webinar electronics here, so I'm sitting down for this thing. I rarely, if ever, do that. I would be walking around wearing my clicker the whole time I'm doing this talk. And I'd wind up at the end of one hour, hour and a half of talk, and I'd have something like 7,000 steps that I've accumulated over time. I'm going to do the thing anyway. So why not do it by coming more active, you know? Don't listen to the, to the psychology business of saying, you know, Oh, go up the go up a flight of stairs, you know. Don't go up the flight of stairs. You know, you're overweight. Stay off the stairs for a while. Walk up and down in front of the elevator and take the elevator. You want to get the <laughs> elevator to yourself? Walk around inside the elevator. Watch how quickly people get off. <laughs> you know, you got go go park in the far reaches of the parking lot. Yeah, you tell someone up in Maine to do that, you know. They're going to slip on the ice and snow in the snow, more likely to get mugged out there. <laughs> Reminds me of a story of a, of a woman who, an elderly woman, was, was sitting there waiting to get a parking space at the mall because our recommendation was, you know, go walk around in the mall. You get the same clicks with less danger associated with it. So she's sitting there waiting for, for the, someone to back out of this parking place, and the car backs out and pulls away. In the meantime, a carload of teenagers come, whips right into that space and cuts her off. She honks her horn and said, young men, don't you have any respect for your elders? You know, and they laugh at her and say, hey, come on, Grandma, we just have respect for the young and the quick. She says, really? Puts her car in reverse, backs it up about 20 feet, slams it into low, and smashes into the back of their car. And they say, what, lady, are you nuts? She says, no, I just want to teach you to have a little respect for the old and the rich. <laughs> that will teach them. <laughs> <laughs> but look at these things. You can say you can reduce. I mean, look at this profound effect over here. This is this is from the Mayo Clinic letter last year. You can reduce your chances of stroke by 22% if you get between 3,000 and 600 more steps a day from the time you get up in the morning to the time you go to bed. If you're oh, wow. a diabetic, you can reduce your chance of death almost by a half. I mean, these are astounding numbers of what you can get from something that every one of you can incorporate into your lifestyle. Oh, wow. Wow. And, and you were saying that this is kind of like a, 
feedback, my own feedback kind of thing. When once you see how you're doing, you internally you're motivated to do more. Is that how it works? Yeah, I think I think the biggest thing is when we start to pack on weight, we start to rationalize. We start to deny reality. Oh, I'll do it tomorrow. Oh, we really not that many calories. I'll get started next week. You know, what the pedometer does is it makes you focus on reality. So if we behave neurotically, and I think that's true, when we begin to gain weight, the way out of neuroticism is to simply face reality. And it, what it does, you get up in the morning and you put that thing on and you finish the day and find out that you have the activity level of a turnip, I'll guarantee you're going to make a change. And it gives you a constant stream of feedback and you can whine to it and say, man, I'm doing this important seminar, I've had this going, the pedometer doesn't care, it takes no prisoners, it gives you exactly what you got. Mm. And many of these listeners, I think many of you folks that are in the sales business, you're inherently competitive anyway, and then you start competing with yourself to see if you can do better than you did the day before. And it is amazing how many times over and over, this is one of these things I liken to almost like vitamin D. It's such a simple thing. Two right. recent literature reviews on this thing, and one in the Journal of American Medical Association, the other one, Annals of Family Medicine, both of them reviewed all the research on wearing pedometers and suggested that not only does it increase your physical activity, but there's significant evidence that will improve your health. Hmm. This is the kind of thing that goes back to the very beginning of the talk when David's talking about this thing of health literacy and learning something. What a great way to learn what your activity level is, is to measure it. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to do anything. You just put it on and keep looking at it periodically throughout the day. One of the last chapters in our book is the whole thing on the glycemic load of foods, which is 735 different foods we have in the back of that book. And again, as I said earlier, I think the research is quite profound in terms of supporting this. Here they are. They're now, the load is, it deals with not just the index, but the amount you typically take. And what it does is it color codes them. So this would be all the low ones are color coded in green. If you go back and look at this, this is alphabetized over here. So you can look at the charts either from an alphabetical standpoint to get the glycemic load, or you can look at it from the standpoint of high versus low. Hmm. And there's just a couple of citations over there of the latest research, I think, or of the most important research that suggests that the glycemic index does, in fact, work. And the reason it does is because of this brief diagram over here that says if you look at where you are now, your insulin level is maintaining a certain average as long as you're not eating. Your glucose level, and we'll skip glucagon for a minute, but it's also responsible for the building of protein or muscle. And then you go out and here at the zero point you eat a food and what happens is your glucose level or sugar level rises and the pancreas says, wow, we're getting too much sugar and it exudes insulin into the system to counteract this glucose rise. And it continues to do it and then glucose starts to come down over here at the same time insulin comes down. And there are adverse effects from both, I just finished another study on this too, adverse effects associated with increased glucose levels over time and even more adverse effects leading to insulin resistance when you raise the insulin. One of the problems with raising insulin is it tells the body to store, not burn fat. So raising insulin levels, you know, has negative consequences associated with it. What the glycemic load does, it enables you to reduce this, lo this line here by eating foods that have a low glycemic load and the same thing with insulin so you reduce both the glucose and the insulin response. Mm -hmm. Now the last the last part of that was it was, that we had in the book was we had some calorie charts that are in the back of the book as well that simply gives you a simple method of estimating your caloric intake as opposed to doing something to measure it. Let me kind of conclude here with saying, look, I have, I have no, no agenda with regard to any particular form of supplements, except I do know that vitamin D works. 
I've been doing this thing for 30 years. I know that if you get a test, you get a measurement, you will change your lifestyle. The answer clearly is in improved health literacy, and the best way to improve your health literacy, I think, is to get valid measurements that are meaningful, and you can track your performance over time. If you have the option of getting a bone density test, by all means get it. If you have the wherewithal to go get a blood chemistry test, call us and let us tell you where you can get that test in your town. I think you will find it invaluable. I think you'll find the clicker invaluable as well. I'd also recommend that Algae Cal supplement, no matter what supplement you're taking now, I would be surprised if it didn't help and improve your bone density even further. I think when we look at the criticisms of the nutritional industry today, it's primarily because we don't have adequate amounts of research to back up the claims that we're making. But I'm convinced that nutritional supplements can work and they can help. And if those of us in this business can start focusing more and more on the things that lead to heart attacks, that lead to cancer, poor diet, low levels of physical activity, and smoking, those three things have been the major causes of death in the United States now, you know, for at least three or four decades. I think if I could give, you know, David a stroke in terms of what they're doing on this in Cherry, what you guys are doing, I think it's right on. I think it's going to make a difference in our culture. I think it's exactly the kind of thing that we need to look at when we're attempting to do something about this massive health care problem that we have in America with the costs going up each year. I think you folks that are selling supplements can make a major contribution. And us in the research business are going to do what we can to validate that contribution that you're going to make. I'm through. <laughs> wow. Wow. Uh, well, Gil, I, uh, this, this has been fantastic. And, uh, again, thank you so, so much for all for this. This is, I mean, this, this is what we're looking for, of course, um, intelligent information with a good sense of humor to go along with it. <laughs> <laughs> we should have a separate webinar on, on Gil and his jokes. <laughs> 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 well, I don't, now, now all those jokes are copyrighted. Now you can use this material, but you can't use those jokes. Okay. <laughs> okay, we'll remember that. You know, we were some. Yeah, you know, we're speaking about aging too, and everything the other day, Dave. You know, I, I was really for a minute there thrilled. You know, I was walking with my wife Shirley. We went into a into a uh, into a bar to go in there and have a nightcap, and there was these two good-looking women sitting at the bar, and they were checking the guys out when they came by. You know. Wow. And they were kind of raiding them. And, and I walked by and said, hello. And they said, nine. And I turned to Shirley and said, that is amazing. I got a nine from these ladies over here. Shirley said, nah, they're just speaking German. <laughs> <laughs> what a bummer. <laughs> well, I'm happy to make you feel too bad to get off. Yeah, that's not the kind of research feedback you need to help you change your behavior. <laughs> Oh, you're too much. You're too much. Um, uh, hey, uh, folks, the, the handouts that Gil mentioned, uh, because this information is so valuable, what we're going to do, usually we, we don't make them available except for members. And, of course, you know, members get all handouts free. But because, I mean, I think everybody needs to have a, have a hold of this. I mean, you guys need to send it out to as many people as possible with these phone numbers so you can uh, – um, People who want to be a part of the research, they can get on on it. So, for this webinar, this webinar alone, webinar alone, maybe okay, there might be others. But for now, we will let everyone have. As long as you send us an email, we will let you have um, the slides for the presentation. I should get a round of applause for that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Sherry. One, no, you should. What do you mean you should get it? I'm the one that should get it. What are you hogging my applause for here? <laughs> this is for Gil. <laughs> hey, 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 Gil, I, I, I did all the work trying to get you on this thing. I mean, 
Well, what, and when, that was... What, when I'm going to tell anybody how, how many times I have called you to get you on the webinar. <laughs> David, I think, the, I think the presentation is over. I don't think we have to go there, do we? <laughs> <laughs> I, guess, I guess not. I guess not. Yeah, but it, it, it really did do yeoman work anyway, yeah. In terms of... And I had to put up with David while he was doing it. <laughs> you, had to, you, had, you had to what? And I had to put up with you while you were doing it. Yeah, yeah. Blood, well, I could see why I'd get frustrated. <laughs> blood, yeah. Well, blood, you know, it was, for, for the people listening, it was a tough thing because, you know, a lot of this material in here that we, that we have is, is copyrighted. We use it in research business. I'm also a public company, so, you know, I, whether I like it or not, I've got to put a business hat on when I do this. I normally would do these things. But, so I tried to get a little entrepreneurial here to justify that by suggesting, you know, you know, we're not going to get rich on that book, and and we're not making any money on the on the other items that I recommended. But uh, but but certainly, I do think you know, and of course, it's ego centered. But I do think you'll find that that the book is not only a good looking book, but it it also is something I think that can make a difference in people's lives. So I do want to encourage you to give us a call and get a copy of that. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely, um, and from the, the, the presentation, I, I, I think I can point to three major stop of, uh, major nutritional things that you that you feel will help improve bone density, body uh, muscle mass, and reduce fat fat mass. And those are al algae, kale, micronutrients, and vitamin D three. Right? Yeah, I would say that vitamin D. When you, when you look at what what the research is showing. I think there are number K two, you know. I think it, I think helps, uh, you know, in terms of vitamin D. But but the strong, I mean, in terms of bone density. But the strongest thing are folks. You, you got to move more, you know. You, you simply are not going to build your bones and reverse them if you maintain your same sedentary level that you're in right now. You want to build bones. You got to move to build them. You got to strain them. And then I would also say increase your calcium level. And I'm biased against eating rocks and think. Probably the better calcium is a plant source. That's why we recommend that. Mm -hmm. How would you call it? Got it. And, and the good thing about exercise is that it also helps to improve your mood and improve your mood. And one of the things we know is that um, depression, yeah, long-term depression, can actually significantly re um, call, reduce bone density through the cortisol and other hormones that actually eat, eat away at the bone. So exercise helps to elevate your mood. Obviously, other things like I'm having a uh, having a meaningful life, having a good job, having good family relationships, all help to improve your mood, and therefore would also help to improve your bone density and, and other things as well. Of course, don't don't forget, folks, that one thing he's going to be saying that Dave is going to be saying about increasing your mood is participate in these seminars too. So <laughs> That's right. It's going to save your bones. That's right. <laughs> and, and move while you listen to the webinar, please. Yeah, Walk around yeah. the room. That's right. You're going to you're going to be stuck with us anyway, so you might as well get something out of it. <laughs> That's right. Okay, I'm going to have to sign off. They could get the MP3 and then listen to it while they go for a walk. There you go. <laughs> uh, Gil, can we just ask a couple of questions because we have we had quite a few. How much time do you have do you have left? Uh, well, go ahead. But, you know, it it you know, uh, I let let me call my wife and see if she think it's okay for me to stay here. <laughs> Okay. okay. Now go ahead. Go ahead. What's the question? Okay. Uh, what is the cost of the book? Uh, cost of the book twenty nine dollars. Twenty nine dollars. Any uh, bulk purchases? Any discounts on that? A you'd have to check with with Julie on that in terms of yeah. If you buy them, I forgot what the volume is. But if you buy them in volume, it's it. It I think depending on how many you buy, I know it goes down to half price. By the time you get it, but I don't know if that's five thousand copies or what. No, it's not. That many. <laughs> but there is a way. I think it's just a, it's it's geared according to the normal wholesale prices. I think, but Julie can give you that number. Just go down through and say if you buy this many, this is the price. Okay. Again, that number is two one zero two seven four six one nine three. Okay. Uh, vitamin D from the sun. Okay. How, for how long? That's always Ten to fifteen minutes a day exposure to the sun. No indication that's going to do anything for you. Watch your sunblock. Read the information we'll provide for you on that, and your your dermatologist may squawk, you know. But I don't think there's any real evidence that 10 to 15 minutes is going to make much difference. It will okay. in your bones, though, and your okay. D level. 
good. Um, Australia, any tests for vitamin D? I guess you know about the United States. Any what? Um, Australia. Someone in Australia wants to know if they can do a test there, but I guess that would be a, there will be a problem sending shipping the blood over here, here for testing. Do you have any yeah. labs over there that can do this? No, but I, but I think the for the Australians they're going to find out it's pretty darn expensive, you know, if they go to a lab over there. There isn't a Quest lab in Australia, but what you need to do is come visit us in the United States, and we can take care of you here. There you go. There we you like go. you folks from down under. <laughs> We have quite a few of them joining us on the webinar, and they've really been, it seems like they've really enjoyed the webinars. Oh, we've had, myself. yeah, we've had some great, some really great relationships with the Australian folks, and they've bought this book already, too, and, you know, it's always great to see them here when they come to these annual meetings. Mm. I have two rods in my back from a plane crash that involves seven, the seven lowest vertebrae. How good can the DEXA work on me? If you have you have two vertebrae that what? I have two rods in my back from yeah. a plane, plane crash that involves uh -huh. the seven lowest vertebrae. How good can the DEXA work on me? I'm not sure. What well, it, it's going to give you a distorted level because that metal that's in there in a rod, if it's one of the metal rods that they're using, is going to give you a higher level of density. But who cares? Do a pre and do a post over there, you know, and look and see what it is. I mean, it's sort of like what have you got to lose by taking, you know, a plant for, form of calcium and some D, uh, it's almost almost axiomatic it's going to help you with your bones. I don't know that it's going to help with any disease thing with regard to uh, restoration of any of the vertebrae. That's another issue. Okay. Uh, I think someone it says available in Australia. She gives a website. Uh, I guess she's referring to your book. Is your book available in Australia as well? Yeah, we sent it out to a lot of people in Australia. Julie can tell you that's surprising. We can get a special uh, book rate in sending it down there. It's not all that expensive to ship it down. Okay. Here's an interesting question. When the bones are dense or healthy, is the marrow healthy as well? It's almost impossible, I think, from the research I've seen, to have healthy bones without it affecting the marrow at the same time. Now, I don't know the research on that specifically. I can just say general because I view bones as an endocrine organ now is what I think the research is showing, and marrow is part of that organ functioning. Got it. Got it. And, the, and the marrow is where the blood cells also are being made from. Okay. All right. I think this pretty much covers most of it. This has been great. Okay. Well, Folks, thanks a lot, and, uh, and again, I want to kind of finish with a pat on the back to you people that are in the nutritional business. I don't want to take a swipe necessarily at Pfizer, but when we see a drug company, you know, that's, that has just been levied a fine today of, of over $2 billion for fraudulent use of their products in the American market, I mean, it, it, I wonder, what are the complaints about nutritional supplements? You're not going to see that kind of fraud in nutritional supplements. You know, and certainly you're not going to see those kinds of side effects and so forth that are associated with those pharmaceutical products. But I really think the key is not to get into this comparison of us versus them, nutrition versus pharmaceutical. I think the real answer to be most successful in your business is, you know, is join them, integrate. Don't attack Fosomax as such. Do what you can because almost any physician prescribing Fosomax, she is also going to, notice I said she, she is also going to prescribe calcium and vitamin D at the same time. So your nutritional supplements can benefit any, any of these people that, that are being treated for any kind of disease. I think the answer is integration, not opposition. Right. I agree. Thank you okay, so folks, much again, Gil. We appreciate and, it. All right. Thank you, you all mm -hmm. a, good evening and God bless, okay? Okay. Bye. God bless Thank you. you. Right. Thank you. Good night. Well, folks, that has been great. Uh, we're just going to sign off here. And please uh, remember next week we have – oops, I shouldn't do that. But ne next week we have um, – who do we have? <laughs> uh, Rick Deitch and – and who's the other And Dr. Coolish next week. So be, be sure to be on it. All right. God bless and have a great night. Good night.